All right. Uh, thanks for having me, Phil. Um, talked to Hugo earlier. I guess it's his mom's birthday today. So uh, happy birthday to Hugo's mom. Um, my name is George Wyatt. I own First Advantage Home Inspection. Um, I've been a builder. Uh, we've been flipping for the last 10 years. We actually are still actively flipping. We still do. Uh, we been trying to switch more to rehabbing houses now and holding them as long-term rentals. So, uh, so this, so what I've done in the past for investors is I help them because there's a lot of newer investors out there. So I try to use my experience from the flipping side, the building side and rental side to help make sure that you don't make a mistake. So, uh, what Hugo has been, and I've done this for Hugo also, and we've done uh, multiple inspections for him before he actually purchased the, purchases the homes. Uh, what we do is we'll walk through the house with you. Um, typically, uh, people that are more advanced don't need me to hold their hand as much, but they use the report to go back to the seller or to the bank and use the report as leverage and that's how you could save thousands on your purchase price so uh, naturally they're not going to reduce the price for uh, a broken window or if it needs a, a roof or dirty carpet or stuff like that but there's certain things in certain ways we can word the report to you take that back to the seller and say i didn't see I, all of this stuff i i need a reduction the other thing I do is I try to help with scopes of work, make sure that your budget is in line with the amount of work that needs to be done. So uh, on this particular uh, inspection, I actually uh, did this one for myself to turn into the bank. Uh, we were trying to buy this as a short sale. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't work. We were dealing with an agent that was, uh, not very experienced in short sales. And so regardless, we did not get this deal, but I thought this would be a good one. This was one that we wanted to buy. We would have kept this as a long-term rental. Uh, so if uh, something you don't understand, please ask questions. I have no problem with that. I'm here to teach and to kind of show you kind of what we were looking at when we were uh, looking to buy this house. So that's the front picture. You can see the address. You can see the front of the house. You can see that this was the snow was on the ground. Um, I never thought I would complain about it being too hot, but uh, I complain about it being too cold with the snow. But uh, so anyhow, so let's keep going. Um, if Phil, if you could scroll down, and I'll tell you when to stop. So this is basically at this point here is just kind of telling us that. Uh, uh, kind of that we're just these are observations that we're making some of these things are my opinion uh, but it's not uh, designed as a warranty that uh, uh, that it's going to, that you're going to use in the future it's just we're trying to show you what the condition of the property is when we're walking through it so okay you can scroll down So basically when I start, I start on the outside, we start on the roof. On this particular house, the roof was covered with snow, but we knew that there was an issue with the roof because inside there was uh, signs of water damage. Uh, so let's keep going. Okay, as you can see here, right in this, I don't know if, can you, can you guys see me what I'm pointing to with my mouse or no? They're not, they're not able to see that. Um. Okay. All right, so in this top picture, right below the snow where it's uh, in the bottom corner, right by where the downspout is, uh, there's actually missing shingles right there. And if you can see from the bottom picture, you could see daylight from the bottom up. So we knew that there was uh, some issues with the roof there. Um, the roof itself, I believe, was in pretty decent shape, but we, we try to make it sound like it's a big, huge ordeal because we wanted money back. We want money off the purchase price or I'm 
particular on short sales, if there's not a lot wrong with them, why would the bank ever want to give you a price reduction? So, uh, so basically, if you guys don't know what a short sale is, a short sale is basically shorting the loan. So if somebody owed 120,000 and it's only worth 80,000, there's no way they could possibly sell it for that. Um, so that so basically, they want to get a reduction on the loan, um, and that's why they call them a short sale. So they're they're kind of cumbersome. They, if people don't really know how to handle them. Uh, a lot of agents don't know how to handle them, um, and you need to be patient because the bank's not in any big hurry to to take a loss on on a loan. So, uh, but you can get really good deals through short sales. Okay. All right, Let's scroll down. So all of these things that you see, these are all the things. We're not going to go line by line, but these are all of the things here. Maybe uh, Phil or Hugo can share this report with you guys, and you can see everything that gets checked during a uh, during a home inspection. So like here, we check the gutters, the soffit, the fascia, the windows, the outside walls, the concrete walkways, the patios, the driveways, the garage, all, all of this stuff. And it's all checked line item by line item. And as you can see, some of it doesn't apply. Some of it is it was acceptable. So there's, that's why you didn't see anything wrong with it. So, all right, go back up a little. Just one more. I think that's it. So downspouts. I'm I've seen a lot of damage with downspouts uh, with foundation issues. Uh, it doesn't happen overnight. This this type of stuff when these downspouts are dumping right next to the house. Basically, it's just kind of eroding the ground little by little by little. And that water's you want to get it away from the foundation. Because uh, in the winter time, it's still water will go down there and it freeze and it starts heaving the foundation, and then you start having foundation issues. So uh, basically, with these downspouts, I don't like splash blocks, even on your personal homes. Uh, I like the if the uh, elbow is sticking out, I like it to be about four or five feet away from the house. The farther the water gets away from the house, the better. So here you can see it just got the elbow dumping in the rocks. That's right next to the house. There should be a gutter extension on that. And then the other one is missing the elbow. You can see the splash block still there. And if you could see at the bottom on the edge of the driveway, it's all starting to crack. And that's just from the water just dumping down over a period of time that will end up ruining the foundation. So as you can see here, in the bottom two pictures, every all the water is dumping right next to the house. Okay. Scroll down. All right. Here is just basically part of where I was showing you that roof. There was down this top picture was part of that back section of the roof. You could see daylight right through the soffit. The soffit is actually the underside of the eave. The fascia is basically what the gutter attaches to. So you can see there's a hole between the bottom where the eave is and through you can see daylight through the roof. Uh, in the bottom picture, you can see all that raw wood. Uh, and this bottom picture that uh, is basically the same as the top. So we don't wanna see any raw wood, um, water and raw wood it'll eventually rot out. So. If this was my house and I ended up buying it, that raw wood, I would have ended up capping it with aluminum so I don't have to keep going back and painting it up here. All right, keep going. All right, this back door here was, uh, it's, it was a, the service door. This actually, this house did not attach, or the garage did, there was no access door to the house. It was only the overhead door and this door, this door was in pretty bad shape. I would have, I wouldn't have scraped and painted it. I would have replaced it. And then in the bottom picture, you could see this, right below the sliding glass door, the wood is starting to rot. The sill is, or the uh, stoop is actually shifted. 
the village would have probably made me fix that because that would have become a trip hazard. So, and these are the things that I would tell you is what I would do. Sometimes the village overrides what I want to do and what you want to do. Uh, I just did a flip where they went, made me change half the garage floor, which I couldn't believe it. It could have just been patched. But like I said, we can't control what the villages make us do. So, all right, let's keep scrolling. All right, all of this, this was siding that I would have uh, probably, uh, I, you could have scraped it, you could have painted it, but we wanted, we would have probably put new siding on. Because like I said, I, I keep the houses, I never plan on selling them. Uh, if I was going to flip this, I would have to see where my budget came in and see would it make more sense to just scrape it and paint it. Or if my budget allowed, I would maybe put new siding. As you can see on this top right picture, that's the door frame that's next to the garage door. Almost 85 to 90% of these, the, the wood touches the ground. Therefore, it's like a, a sponge. It sucks up all the water and it rocks it out. And on this particular house, I would have re, uh, capped that wood with aluminum because I know every single, I'm not gonna go out there and scrape it and paint it every single year. So, all right. Let's see. All right, so remember this crack um, and I'll show you why, but that's what we're looking for. We're looking for that kind of stuff. The, the cracks are not as big of a deal as people make them out to be, as long as the crack is parallel. Meaning if you look down the side of this foundation, if the one side of the foundation of the crack is bulging, meaning it's not parallel, like if you took a straight edge, that should still be straight, right? The, the foundation. Now, if it starts heaving one way or the other, now you have a big structural problem. So, but we here, we made it, we tried to make a big deal out of it to get our price reduction. So like here, it says it's a serious crack is a symptom of a serious structural problem. We just wanted to bank the thing as a serious structural problem. But remember that crack, because we'll, I'll show you on the inside of the house what that looks like. And typically cracks can be replaced or uh, repaired depending on how many cracks you have, the more cracks you have, the price goes down. So if you had one crack, the perma seal come out, it would cost you probably around 500 bucks. If you had multiple cracks, say three or four of them, now they might be 300 a bucks a, a, a piece. So, uh, so it's not terribly expensive to fix cracks unless I inspect it and I say, you just can't buy this house. Cause some of them, uh, the walls are bulging in so so bad that you would uh, it would it would cost you twenty thousand thirty thousand to fix some of these foundations. Those are the ones you want to walk away from. All right, let's keep going. All right, okay, the driveway. Um, if I was I was trying to make it to. to it's rough shape, should be repaired or replaced. Some villages, they may or may not make you replace the driveway. I would recommend talking with the building department for their evaluation. I would probably just cut the bad sections out, patch it, and then put a nice seal coating on it. But uh, in the report, we want to make it juicy to try to get you the price reduction. So, uh, and sometimes people say, well, I thought you said it was fine. And in your report, it's so you just have to read between the lines. I'm trying to save you money. And when we're in there talking about it, uh, I'm telling you what you should do. Okay, let's keep going. All right, in the garage, and this is in every village, there's never going to allow this. So you would see this wall here where this extension cord is, uh, that was the, that, part of the garage adjoined to the house. So there was no entrance from the garage into the house. But when we look at this, we want to make sure that the drywall goes all the way from the floor, all the way up to the ceiling, because that's a firewall. 
So uh, what's a firewall? Firewall is if a uh, fire started in the garage, this should all be sealed either with drywall, fire taped. There should be no openings from between the garage and the house. But the other thing, the thing we're looking at here is the garage door opener is actually, it's actually goes through the wall and plugs into an outlet inside the house. So that's no way that that would ever uh, pass any village. So what would have to happen is you would have to get electric if you wanted to keep the garage door opener. You would have to get electric to that hard piped in a box with a single outlet. So extension cords are temporary wiring and no village will allow that as your wire. Okay. Here you can see all the different things. Uh, it had a crawl space, poured foundation, post with poured concrete. So all of this stuff kind of gives you an overview of what you're buying. So it's uh it's not really necessary. I mean, it's why not put it in the report for you. Okay. Keep going. All right. So remember what uh, the crack on the outside, if you can see just the top picture there, that's all wet, right? And that's coming from that crack from the outside that we just showed you. So we were trying to make a big, huge deal out of it. And, oh, there's foundation issues, which this crack I could have fixed probably for about anywhere from three, four, five hundred bucks. This footing, the, the one at the bottom right, it's got a small crack from the footing. That's just a, it's, it's a stress crack. It's nothing, but we wanted to make it look like a big deal. So, um, and then if you can see here, let's see, I think I have this somewhere else, but this pipe here coming up, that's coming up from the sump pump. Uh, and you see there's just a rubber boot there. We'll go back. I, I think I have that in a different picture. And here at the bottom picture here, you can see the other crack. Uh, this is very common. This is, if you could see right at the very top of the picture, that's the beam pocket and almost all of the foundations are cracked right by that beam pocket. And I don't know if you can see that crack that goes straight right in the middle of the picture, straight up and down. Uh, that's nothing, that's just nonsense. Just, we wanted to make them think. And, and I'm gonna show you on stuff like that. Um, those cracks are really nothing. There's nothing to be afraid of. Uh, okay, the one thing, if I'm not with you and you're looking at houses, you always want to, uh, around the toilet, you want to stand around the toilet, around the sides of it, the front of it, the back of it. And the reason I say that is because if a toilet's leaking for a long period of time, it'll actually start ruining the subfloor and possibly some of the floor joists. So if the floor is soft, you, you, then you want to go underneath, like in this case, we'll be able to see in a different picture. Actually, I think it's this picture right to the bottom left. Some of the floor joists were, uh, were starting to rot. And out of that toilet, I, I don't know if you guys can see on the bottom right that there's like a, a wet spot that was all coming from that toilet area. We couldn't exactly see where it was coming from but it was definitely something was leaking. Uh, so in this particular case, I was planning on ripping the whole floor up and gutting this whole bathroom because I know that there was floor issues. So that's, that's why you would want to step around the toilet and you should try to put the toilet in between your calves, if, I, if that makes sense, and shake a little bit and see if the toilet's loose. And in this case, it, it was tight, but it was loose, or it was leaking. All right. All right. If you can see here, I don't know if you can see between the two pieces of wood here, there's like a black spot there. Um, there was water staining. I mean, we, it was dry when we checked it, but whenever we see that, 
that we want to make sure when the snow melts that there's not a problem. So what I would do in this particular case, because with the parts of the roof that I could see without the snow on it, the roof looked to be in decent shape. So what I would do is when the snow melted is I would have the roofer go up there and evaluate it further. And just because there's uh, some leakage doesn't mean you need to change the whole roof. You might be able to patch it. So patching it doesn't mean using a bunch of tar. Patching it means taking the bad shingles out and putting new shingles in. Sometimes there'll be a little discolor, even if you get the exact same shingle. Um, you put a shingle out in the sun for five months, five years, whatever, and then you take the same brand new shingle, same color, and put it next to it, it's not going to match, but that's okay. Okay, let's keep going. And here we just basically tell you what kind of electric you have. This particular house had a 100 amp, amp service. Uh, the, this, the main panel was in the basement, what kind of panel, it had breakers. Uh, we were unable to verify the grounding termination. Typically, uh, we want that to be grounded to the water meter. Uh, before the water meter, after the water meter, you would take a clamp with a wire. And then the other thing is a lot of the villages will want you to put a ground rod outside and make sure that it's grounded. And it tells you how the outlets are 15 amp, 20 amp, and GFIs. GFIs are basically a little outlet. I'm sure you've seen them before. Uh, it's called a ground fault circuit interrupter. And it's a mini breaker inside the outlet, which you typically are supposed to have outside the house, in the garage, anything within six feet of a kitchen sink, laundry sink, or a bathroom. So here, I don't know what the village would require us to do with this because, for one, the panel was missing the cover, the outside cover, to protect you from sticking your hand in. The other thing is, if you can see here, every, that box is totally full, every, meaning every breaker is in there. A lot of villages will not accept that which I would tell you, I would check with the building department, um, but typically they don't want it any more than 75% of capacity, meaning if you have 20 breakers in the, in the box or openings, you can't fill them all. You, you have to have like four or five open, um, or the village could require you to change the panel. The panel is usually anywhere from 15 to $2,000 to replace it. So um, if you got a smaller budget, uh, that, that could hurt your budget. Just uh, $2,500, $2,000 you didn't plan on. So, all right, let's keep going. Hey, George, quick question. Yep. Um, so on that last one, and by the way, I, uh, I own a multifamily property in uh, Harwood Heights and have encountered something similar. Uh, is there a recommendation that you would uh, make in regards to how full that uh, panel should be? Because what I've noticed is also if let's just say it's less than 50 percent full, especially if you own, let's just say, a multifamily property or you're looking for one, that could also cause issues where, you know, if there's too few circuits in the unit, you know, especially right now in the summer, you got folks in three different bedrooms running ACs at the same time, you know, and those circuits are maybe connected to the kitchen uh, appliances as well. That can cause a lot of issues where the circuits, you know, could could trip and then you're getting consistent power outages as well. So is there a, a, a happy medium there between maybe 50 to 75 that you'd say that we should be looking for? Well, every each thing should be on its own circuit. Like if you're running, yeah. let's say, the appliances or you're running an air conditioner or you're running a sump pump, all of these things should be on their own circuit. So all of my properties, I have a licensed electrician look at. Unless mm -hmm. it's just little piddly stuff, if it's just a real minor rehab. But if I was going to buy a multi-unit, like I just did a, a two-unit building yesterday. There was two breaker, three breakers for each unit. Well, we know for a fact that there's no way you could run the all the kitchen, the appliances, all the outlets, the lights, everything on those three breakers. 
it's impossible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that would throw a red flag right away. I would have a licensed electrician. Plus, nothing was labeled. So if, if it's not labeled, I would definitely want it labeled for my tenant. Or if I'm flipping it, I know that the next home inspector, because I can't flip, I can't hire myself to do the inspections for my flips, right? So, so I know that the next home inspector is going to get me for it. But I, it's, I would definitely break up some of those circuits. If it was me, um, yeah. I know, um, cause if you got multi units and you only have two or three breakers being used out of, so let's say it's a 10 pole panel, something's wrong unless it's a one bedroom apartment. Yeah. 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 And then, uh, what, what would you recommend in regards to, right? You say like bringing licensed electrician in, um, for example, mine are all, uh, pushmatic breakers. Right. And so yeah. the, they're going to look at that and automatically say, Hey, this is auto, we're automatically replacing it. We're not even going to take a second look at it, but they all technically work fine still. Right. And so if I'm trying to add more uh, breakers in there and more circuits for my unit. Right. How do I kind of get around? I mean, do I just have to find the right person or is it more so just uh, do you have any recommendation there? Cause they're just going to automatically want to charge you, you know, five grand and just replace everything uh, in terms and in, instead of actually doing the right work and which is going to still fix the problem and actually get you the result that you want. Right. Well, that's, is the glass half empty or is it half full? I don't like pushmatics personally. Yeah. Uh, the reason, and here's why it's because they, they're probably working fine, but sometimes when they need to trip, they don't, and that causes fires. So that's why the electricians don't like them much either. Um, so it's, I would, I would just get a few different people out there to look at it, you know, try to ask people in the vault, ask people at, at the investor clubs. Uh, I have a pretty good electric. Where's the property at? Uh, Harwood Heights. Harwood Heights. I don't Up know. by like O'Hare, Rosemont, that area. Yeah, he won't go that far. He's kind of a prima donna, but <laughs> He's honest with me. I mean, he always yeah. does what I ask unless it's, you know, something that he can lose his license for. But that's just what you need. You need somebody that's, um, there's a guy in Chicago, Rhea, um, what's his name? Julian Alvarez. He owns, I uh, can't remember the name of his company. Hugo would probably know him. Um, hang on, I, I think I have his number. Don't abuse him, but uh, he might, you know, because he's an investor himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, that's what I'm looking for exactly. Because most of these electricians, most the average electricians, I feel like, you know, they're they'll they'll just look at you and say, hey, let me just, like I said, replace everything, and and that might not even really solve the the issue they're experiencing. So that's why, like you said, I'm looking for somebody who's going to be able to really help me out with my particular situation and also understand the constraints of working as an investor where every penny counts. Right. Well, I'll give you his phone number. His name's Julian. Okay. His phone number is 630-808-7916. All right. All right. Thank you very much. No problem. And just, you know, tell them that you know me and, uh, and hopefully you can help you out. But definitely you want it to be safe. Mm -hmm, I just had a mental burn down and it was an electrical fire. I don't think it was anything that we did. Um, I think it was a space heater that caught fire, but mm -hmm. now I'm even tenfold more anal about electrical than I used to be. So, yeah. So, and Mark, your question, please. I give you general pricing. Okay, because I might get better pricing than you. And so if I, I know I can change a panel for 1500 bucks. And with the service, the service is actually the pole on the outside, uh, three grand. But I've heard people pay six grand. So I can only give you what I know that I pay. Um, and then there's people that get better prices than me, but. Uh, so we just try to make sure that if you come into a house, like this house that we're showing you right now, 
my budget to rehab this was 40 grand. Um, so, but I've done quite a few that are similar to these, this house. So um, that was me taking a half bath in the basement and turning it into a full bath and taking the living room in the basement and adding a fourth bedroom. All right, let's keep moving on here. All right, so BX. BX is basically, see, I don't know if you can see that top picture. It's kind of like a spiral flexible cable. Any village you go to will never allow that. So anything that they see, you'll have to upgrade the conduit. Conduit is a hard pipe that the wires run into. And that's what these pictures, both of those pictures were. So, okay, if you guys can remember what we were talking about uh, earlier, uh, GFIs need to be in it. Anything outdoors needs to be a bubble type uh, waterproof outlet that uh, is GFI protected. Anything within six feet of a kitchen sink and usually typically any of your bathroom uh, is typically right by the sink and your laundry should be a gfi also so that's what all these all that uh, one with the nice beautiful uh tin backsplash whatever that is uh those were the kitchen ones um and then you could see this bottom one was the bathroom gfi that was just broken half Here's everything that we tech check on the heating system. Is it gas? Is it black pipe? Is it a, a mid efficient furnace? Is it a high efficient furnace? Is it a conventional furnace? Which typically, if it's a conventional furnace, those are really, really old and you should probably change it. Okay. Here, you see my hand is pointing down. This pipe was actually going to the water heater vent. Well, the vent needs to be going up a quarter inch a foot uh, so that it vents properly. If it doesn't do that, it can backdraft back down and backdrafting is carbon monoxide going in the air. Um, so we never want to see that. So that's a safety issue. So One thing I think I glazed over the uh, uh, on the electric, the smokes and carbons. Uh, bedrooms all should have, and most villages will require this if it's a rental. And some villages will, I'll just tell you what I would do and what I think code is. Uh, I would put smoke detectors in every bedroom with a combo, meaning combo smoke slash carbon. They're not that much difference in price. Uh, I also put them on every level. So basically, if I had a basement, a main level, so the basement, even if it's finished, unfinished, somewhere near the furnace uh, and hot water tank, if my main level is just kitchen and a living room, no bedroom, I'd still want one on that level. And then I would want uh, combos in the bedrooms. The reason is it's safety, right? I mean, if one... You only have one and it fails, somebody's dying. So it's uh, better to be safe than sorry. That's my All right. Cooling, it was uh, too cold to test the air conditioner, but you can see all the fins here are uh, starting to go. If I'm going to keep it, if, if I'm going to flip it, let's change back. I used to, if I thought it was old, I would change it. You don't need to do that anymore. If it works, keep it. If it's a rental, keep it. Typically, you can have a heating guy come out in 24 to 48 hours. Once you start working with somebody on a regular basis, they'll come out and they'll be happy to change it for you. So in this weather, I don't know how fast they'll get there, but you don't want your tenant to be living in this heat with no air conditioning. They would not be happy. 
right? Here we go into the plumbing. Uh, we tell you what kind of water heater, what kind of uh, piping comes into the house. Uh, typically, we don't like to see galvanized pipe. Uh, reason being is galvanized pipe calcifies and it basically corrodes over time. It starts out as a half inch or three quarter pipe and over time it calcifies to where you have no water pressure. So if it's in my budget, I will definitely always take the galvanized pipe out and put copper pipes in. Um, reason being is if you had to cut people's walls open to fix their plumbing while they're living there, not good. For a flip, if I have good water pressure, I, I'll try to hope that I don't have to do it. Uh, but that's my thing. So anyhow, so here we go back to the toilet, right? That would, the floor was soft. You can see underneath here, some of the wood is rotted. Uh, we definitely were going to, I think we already covered that. Uh, my thoughts on PEX. PEX is fine. Um, if the village will allow it. Uh, most villages want copper, they're still old school, but you would, you would check with the village. I would like PAX because it's cheaper and you don't have the thieves gonna steal it on you. So, and that's another thing that's getting more and more common, just so you guys know, um, squatters galore, right? The, the courts are closed right now. Um, so what they're doing, they're taking vacant buildings or vacant just something that they can live in. They print up a fake lease, they're living in your house now. So, uh, so it's getting, getting goofy out there. So the courts are closed. So what happens, you call the police, they have a lease. Now it's a civil matter and there's nothing you can do about it. It's, uh, unfortunate. So, um, okay, so this was the pipe that I was talking about earlier. This is the sump pump. Um, it does not have a check valve. So a check valve is basically a one-way valve. When the, when the pump fills or, or this uh, pit at the bottom here, fills up with water, the sump pump kicks on, and then it shoots the water outside. Well, when it's pump shuts off, you don't want all that water to come right back down into the pit. So, um, so that's why, let's see, go back up for one second. With this sump pump, I don't think this sump pump worked. I don't remember. But typically, I would change the sump pump. Uh, if I'm going to keep it, uh, I would put a Zoller pump. Uh, Zoller, Z O E L L E R. It's a cast iron pump. They're good for five to 10 years. Most reputable plumbers, that's the only pump they'll use. If I'm going to flip it, I'm putting a cheap pump in uh, because it'll it'll last at least a year or two. Uh, injector pump, the same thing. It's got a vent pipe and then it's got a discharge that should also have a check valve. Okay, keep going. All right. Anytime you see these chrome uh, P traps, eighty percent of them are garbage. Uh, unless it's brand new. Uh, these also rot from the inside out. So by the time you see corrosion, it's time to be replaced. Um, I would always change these with plastic. They don't rust. And then the upstairs vanity, you can see that thing was toast. Uh, but with that being said, on my rentals, I do maintenance inspections every three months. It basically because I've had vanities and kitchen cabinets um, from a minor little leak destroyed the cabinet. So now I make sure that there's no leaks under the sinks, under the vanities. I check the smoke detectors, I change the furnace filter and I snoop basically. Uh, I don't want you to go there two years later and find out their, your house is trash. So. Uh, when they know you're coming every three months, it seems like they'd take a little bit better care of it. You know? uh, Fresh says, uh, possible to put two sump pumps in place of one. One doesn't work, the other one keeps in. Oh, let's see. I can answer that. 
Yeah, a lot of people believe in battery backups. Battery backups are only as good as with the person taking care of it. So the battery, uh, when it's new, is good for 12 hours of pump time. Um, as the battery gets older, it's it goes down actually, right? So if your power goes out for three year, three days, the battery backup's not going to do you a whole lot of good. So uh, as far as putting two sump pumps in the hole, they had what used to be called ace in the hole, um, which was a pump that was above the other pump. I don't know. I I don't really have a good answer for you, I guess. But what I'm trying to say is uh, I would just put a good quality pump in if, it, if you're keeping it. If uh, any time that it severe rain you're going to want to make sure that that pump is working um and if it's a rental i would just recommend change it unless you put a zola in i would i would change it probably every two or three years they're not that expensive they're easy to change and you should be able to do it yourself but if you if you can't you shouldn't pay any more than 50 bucks labor to put a pump in. all right where are we at here uh bathtub well you can see here this was that same bathroom i was showing you with the floor was all running out uh, typically depending on my budget because you see this bottom picture you have the two knobs here most villages won't allow that they're going to want what's called the anti-scald valve so if you flush the toilet or you turn on the water while somebody's taking a shower you don't burn them uh, and the, and the anti scalds are actually the you can control the temperature uh, because the village is going to do a temperature test that that uh, water can be no more than 115 degrees coming out of the tub spout. So this there's no way to adjust this type of faucet. Uh, but if the tile was all in decent shape, the tub was a little rough, you can glaze these tubs and glaze this tile and they can make it look like brand new. Um, and I can't remember what I was, I think I was just gonna duck this bathroom. But if I didn't have to, even as bad as this uh, soap dish coming at, you know, that type up there, uh, this mold in the corner, the tub is ugly. Uh, you can still get to the back of this faucet and they make a anti-scald two valve, uh, and then they make a big remodel plate to cover all of that. So uh, if you didn't want to gut the bathroom, there's ways to get around it. So, but tub glazing to, tub, to glaze a tub and all of this tile that's surround, uh, it's about 650 bucks. If you're gonna glaze just the tub, it's about 350. Oh, okay. Right. Typically on the interior, this is kind of nonsense for investors. Typically we're going to, we know the carpet's trash. We know the, the flooring is trash. The vinyl flooring is ripped. It's so, I mean, it's, I still put it in the report for you, but there's no reason that uh, I need to, but I do it anyhow. So, okay, let's keep going. All right, so here you see all the rot around the window. I don't know what happened here. Uh, if somebody left the window open, but it, this was all water damage right around this window. So I would have to wonder, did, was it uh, installed properly? Um, I would want to fix it and then come back and then it's damaged again. So you have to figure out what, what the cause is and then fix it from there. So. And if you can look at look at the bottom, look at this. So on all of my properties, I always change all of the outlets and all the switches. You see this outlet in the bottom picture? It looks like it's charred, right? So that's why you would want to do that. Um, it's, uh, I don't know, maybe it's just dirt, but I've seen a lot of them where the, the one of the prongs is burnt off and it's stuck in the outlet. So it's just uh, my peace of mind knowing that the, uh, outlets are wired properly, the switches are wired properly, and the outlets 
you know, buy a case of 10 outlets, I think for four bucks. So you know, a good electrician, they could change that outlet in about 10 minutes, not even. Okay, let's keep going. There, just somebody kicked the door in, the whole jam was busted out. This bifold door, half of it was missing. Not a big fan of these uh, mirrored uh, sliders, just because kids mess around and uh, just, I'm always thinking somebody's gonna get hurt. So um, if they're there and they work, I probably wouldn't change it, but I'm not a fan. Mark says, George, do you use one specific contractor or do you hire all the trades yourself? <laughs> uh, well, I used to do, I GC'd everything myself. But I hired professional drywaller, professional electrician, plumbers, heating guy, tile guy, trim carpenters, regular carpenters. But what was happening was I'd have my demo guys go in there and I would line up my plumber right away and I'd line up my heating guy and my electrician and the demo guy didn't show up for three days. So then I called the plumber, I said, well, he's not quite done, he'll be done tomorrow. Well, I had to start another job. So what was happening to me was I would have to wait three or four days in between trades well, you start adding that up times 10 trades, the next thing you had a month of downtime. Well, when you're paying the taxes, insurance, utilities, if you're using hard money or private money, that's it, it just gets expensive. So with your question, I hired a guy, I still try to use my own mechanical people, electrician, plumber, heating guy, and I just had a terrible experience the last three houses with different contractors that can do drywall, painting, tile, flooring, because it, I thought it would be easier to manage one guy than five different trades. The problem is when you hire the guy that can do five different jobs, he's not really that good at any of them. My, this last one I'm talking about it was a six week project and we're on week 14. So um, kind of touched a nerve on that. Sorry, Mark, but that's, I've been doing this a long time. And if you can find a good contractor, take care of him, buy him flowers, whatever you gotta do. It's, uh, it's hard finding good ones. Good ones are usually so busy you can't get them. So it just happens. But now that inventory is way down, um, might, be get, might be getting our cream of the crop here pretty soon. All right, so you see, remember that crack I showed you before? Now this is kind of more of a close-up here. Now we're trying to hit them with mold, right? It's the foundation's cracked, it's leaking. You can see at the bottom left picture, you see the mold behind the drywall. You see on the on the column here on the paper, uh, the cardboard tube, it, it's got mold. So these are the things that are nothing. This is all nothing. It's nonsense and nothing you should be afraid of. But it is something that you want to use for your favor because this was in a crawl space. So typically, if you put this under contract, you're not in the crawl space. So no, nobody should be in a crawl space when they're putting a bid in, nor should they be in the attic, right? Or should they be looking inside an electrical panel, stuff like that. Those are the things that you're getting the price reduction. These, these three pictures right here. All right, so keep going. This is pretty obvious, even if it's a rental or a flip, that's, I don't know, these had to be on sale at Kmart cabinets because they were like plastic and this is kind of like a wallpaper. Um, and that was a, the way they were made. That wasn't somebody, somebody didn't put that paper on there. It was just garbage cabinets. This is the kind of stuff you, you're not going to get a discount on that. 
Um, but we were trying to make as much wrong with the house for the bank to see. That's why we put all those pictures. All right. So here's the attic. I always, nobody usually goes up in the attic. So in your report, I always throw a couple pictures in there just so you know what it looks like. Uh, you can see there's plenty of insulation up here. Uh, and then you see that air gap there. That's how the attic is actually breathing. So there was, I don't think there was soffit vents in here. So there was openings uh, and you want that attic to breathe. Uh, so that's, that's why I took a picture of that. All right, let's keep going. Right. You see all the insulation. Typically, insulation uh, attics or crawl spaces should be insulated, which it was. You can see it was all glued and uh, stuck to the wall while all of it fell off. And behind this insulation, this right here, that top picture, you can see I pulled that insulation away because that was about where that crack was outside and I wanted to see what was behind it. All these ducts should be insulated. Uh, you can see this bottom left, the duct is just running to nothing. Here in the bottom right, you can see the whole piece is just kind of laying on the ground so it probably just fell off. That, that was going into the living room, so there would have been no heat or air conditioning running into that room. All right. Um, uh, okay, you're mentioning, okay, Julian has a question. You're mentioning most of these are non issues, but if you had to rank the top three to five issues to look for doing an inspection, it would cost an investor a lot of money. How many what would they be? Any to avoid at all costs. Yep, uh, roof is an expensive one. So, but with that being said, roof isn't terrible if you're rehabbing a house. It's, you know, uh, I would never recommend putting a, a roof on a bad roof, meaning putting a second layer on. Uh, I see it a lot. Uh, one of the reasons if you're keeping it long term, the shingles don't last half as long as if you just put it on because the shingles need to breathe, right? So I want all that old stuff off because typically you're not going to have fire and ice and water shield around the edges. You're not going to have the proper drip edge. You're not going to have the proper venting. And then now you're taking a one inch nail, uh, trying to nail the second layer on two layers of roof i just don't like it though so i did one the other day they thought they were trying to get one over on me and they cut all of the shingles one foot back but on the side of the house you could see there was four layers of shingles that the structure is not made for that kind of weight um, i just would implore you not to do it if you're doing a quick flip you know um, and your budget's really tight maybe do that but it's just uh it's not the proper way to do it. So, um, so the roof is one uh electrical if you need a panel um that's you know if you need a panel and service that's three grand if you need heating and air conditioning i pay uh, for a new furnace and new air conditioning about 3500 bucks um, foundation problems depending on what they are that's a big one if it's major um, but the stuff i'm just showing you here was kind of nonsense stuff um, but those would those would be the big thing the electric uh galvanized pipe if it's got galvanized pipe to do a repipe could be anywhere from five to eight thousand dollars to cut all the old stuff out. Uh, if it has a boiler system, um, I would make sure all your radiators are working. I would make sure that all of, uh, I've done a lot of them lately. I don't know why, but a lot of boilers, boilers themselves don't really go bad. The parts go bad. Uh, you can usually see boilers that are 30 to 50 years old, uh, but a lot of those pipes are wrapped in asbestos. 
So just be mindful of that. If you see a big white tube over pipes in a basement, that's asbestos usually. Um, I think those are the big things. Um, but if you ever um, get something under contract, I implore you, don't be afraid of these houses or that you're going to make a mistake because if I've made a million of them. And the only way to learn is to do. So, and when once you sign a contract, doesn't mean you're tied into the house. You can still get out of the contract by me. I've told people you can't buy this house. Or maybe you get it under contract and maybe it's too big of a job for you. Call me. I'll buy it from you. So it's, you know what I mean? It's just, uh, I see it all the time. People get cold feet. They, they give the house back to the bank. And, you know, there's somebody... There's a seat for every saddle, and why don't you wholesale it and make five grand? I went through the aggravation of getting the contract and uh, going out there and looking at it, make a few bucks. So, all right. So in the attic, you can see through this vent that birds were making nests up here. And then in the bottom picture, you can see something was living up here. It's all shredded. Like it's when I opened the attic door all of this fell down on my head so it was uh, uh so i don't know if the, an animal was chewing something up there when i went up there i couldn't find any animals up there but uh there was definitely something up there okay and mark yeah i was trying to do that rehab for 40 grand probably would have been more like 50 because i was going to add a bathroom and a but I was keeping it long term, and I would have changed it from a seventeen hundred a month rental to a two thousand a month. So I would have made my money back in like three or four years. All right, uh, okay, let's keep going. Uh, appliances. Typically, we don't change, check the appliances unless it's a turnkey or livable, because most people are going to change the appliances. Um, not too often do I go into a, a house where the appliances can be saved. Um, exhaust fans, um, I always recommend. A lot of cities now, it used to be if you had a window in a bathroom, uh, you didn't need an exhaust fan. But a lot of the cities now, if you're getting permits, that's one of the requirements now. Um, we see a lot of these fans just dump it into the attic. Uh, we don't like to see that because the steam from the shower, that's what's sucking up there and that's all moisture. And if it goes up in the attic, at some point it's gonna turn to mold. So we typically want these to be vented straight out the roof. These fans cost about, uh, for a cheap one, maybe 20 bucks. Uh, it's probably three or 400 by the time you pay the HVAC guy to run a pipe and a vent through the roof and then an electrician to run power to it. But if you're keeping it as a rental, highly, highly, highly recommend putting exhaust fans in there. If you don't, make sure you paint the ceiling with a, like a high gloss paint and not with a, like a, what you would normally use flat paint because a flat paint will absorb all that moisture and you'll be repainting it every year or two. Plus it'll turn into mold. All right, let's keep going. Am I done? Looks like. Nope, well, that's the end of that tour. So um, there, were, there were some issues there, but most of it was cosmetic. Oh, yeah, see, I did add some more stuff. See? Remember what I said, I'm trying to make my case. So this little piece I would cut out and put a little piece of drywall in its place and I fixed the mold. So by a year in my comments, I would have a mold company come out and mitigate what appears to be mold, right? Because we're not testing for mold, but it's pretty obvious it's moldy, right? So then at the end of my reports, the only thing it doesn't have, but everything that I said was wrong, is in a summary at the back of the back two, three pages. Um, the only unfortunate part is it doesn't come with the picture. So, so that way you can you can just print out the one or two, three pages 
and you can highlight what you want to go back to your attorney and try to get price reductions. Um, naturally, you can't go on a bank-owned home. That's I think we were trying to buy that one for 65. Uh, we were trying to use the report to get a price reduction, uh, and the lady just was horrible to deal with. But anyhow, uh, that back end of that, how we thought uh, the back end with that, because I own the one a block down on the other side of the street. Um, I'm getting 1900 a month in rent and it appraised for 165 So that, I really wanted that house because it was close to my other one. And it was, uh, it didn't look worse than it really was. Uh, but, you know, people that come with budgets of fifteen to $20,000, let me tell you guys, that doesn't go very far. Um, so, uh, anybody have any more questions? Yes, uh, we, if you have questions, please feel free to send it uh, via chat. Uh, we'll be available uh, for three minutes for the questions. Hopefully I and, mm -hmm, didn't yes. sleep there, Phil. <laughs> um, by the way, my name is Phil. Uh, I'm actually taking over Hugo today. He is not available. Um, it's his mother's birthday, so I'm taking over the, as host today. Yeah, we have a question from Mark. Uh, do you estimate your rehab budget by the square feet? Um, oh, I don't. I, um... I know some people have a formula to do that. Um, I think it's, what is it, like $3 a foot, depending on what size rehab it is. I mean, because if it's a cosmetic rehab, that doesn't work. If it's a medium rehab, it doesn't, it might work. Full rehab, it doesn't work. Because this was uh, a medium rehab, in my opinion. So if I, uh, this was about 1,200 square feet. Um, I guess the $3 would work for that, $3 a foot. But it depends what it needs. If it needed siding, it needed roof, it needed windows, it, you know, it's really hard to uh, estimate it that way. What I would do is just start, uh, you know, I help with that. I can help you with your scope of work. I can help you with your budget. What it, you know, like a kitchen. If you're going to do new kitchen cabinets, countertops, flooring, appliances, figure about seven grand. If you're doing a bathroom with a full gut, it's five grand. Uh, flooring is typically five dollars a foot um, for vinyl or ceramic. If it's hardwood, it's probably seven dollars a foot. Painting, and it can be all over the map because if you're painting trim and doors, um, it's one price. If you're painting, if you're saving the trim, it's just say it's oak trim and you're saving it, you're just painting walls, that's a totally different price. So it's uh, windows, you should pay no more than $300 a window for us double hung. That's taking the old one out, putting a new one in, uh, caulking, insulating, capping, and having them take it with them. Uh, so it's, I can help with all those things, the average roof for a tear off and in, in a, you know, cause I don't buy big houses. I, I, I used to every big house I, I bought and I've rehabbed, I've lost one. Stay with the 1500 square foot houses right around there. Thousand square foot houses are easy to manage. Even if you make a mistake, uh, you can, you can usually get out of it pretty, uh, without getting hurt too bad. But I did a couple 3,000 square foot houses and that's just a lot of house, and a lot of things to go wrong. So, uh, okay, thank you so much, George. We have a question from Raphael. Would you do a walkthrough before we put a property under contract? I wouldn't. Um, okay. The reason being is what if you don't get the contract Then you're paying me for nothing? Uh, so you'll have five business days to do a, uh, inspection and that'll get you out of it. So I do offer two different services. One is a, a walk and talk, which is a full inspection. You take notes, you take pictures. Um, you can ask questions. I, I, 
I'm there for you. That uh, inspection up to 1,500 square feet is 250 bucks. As long as it's in my, I'm putting this as a disclaimer now, as long as it's in my travel area, because I've had people call me and want to go up to Waukegan and Rockford. It's two hours. I mean, I'll do it, but you're going to pay me to drive. So sometimes you're better off getting somebody in your own backyard. Unless you need help with the scope, unless you need help with the budget, then typically your home inspector isn't going to normally do that. Um, and then, like Hugo always recommends that you get a report, um, and that's 375 so it's an extra $125 with the report. I do all the notes. I do exactly what you just seen here. Um, and you could still walk and talk. Doesn't mean that, you know, I think some people are misled by, well, I, I want to be able to ask questions. Well, you could do it either way. So, uh, but without the report, usually the bank isn't going to take your word for it. They need a, a report or something, some type of proof. So, uh, so that's Raphael's question. Um, any experience okay. advice regarding using the Home Depot Pro Desk contractors for kitchen and bathroom? That's hit or miss, Julian. Um, if I was new and or if I moved to a new town and I had to start from scratch, I'd be at the Home Depot um, at six o'clock in the morning. Those are the those are the real contractors because they want to get their material and get on the job, get going at seven o'clock. You don't want the guys that are showing up, not saying that the guys that come at 10, maybe they just stopped and they, they needed something real quick, but that's what I would do. I would, uh, if you're looking for contractors and if you have any kind of relationship with the pro desk, sometimes they can refer, but Best, best referral, best way to find people is referrals that somebody else used and that they had a good experience. And I, would, I wouldn't be shy about asking for referrals. Uh, you don't want somebody that has no reserves because they'll be trying to get advances. They'll want money up front. Uh, don't ever pay anybody up front because you'll probably never see them again. So you know, if they if they don't have enough money in their pocket to get the job started, then that's not your guy. And okay. Then sometimes they'll want the money too because they don't know you and are you going to pay them? But I I I don't care. You can put a lien on my house. There's a lot you can do to me if I don't pay. You. So throw a brick through the window. But if I give you money and you don't show up, I'm never finding you again. All right. Sounds good. So yes, thank you so much, George, for uh, answering the questions and for uh, as well delivering a very good presentation today with the service and uh, the great work that you have done for the press for for today. Um, we have actually provided George contact information. So if you have questions or you need assistance with George, feel free to reach out to him uh, through his email and uh, through his contact number uh, that we have uh, provided. Um, George, anything you would like to add? Yeah, Phil, the email's wrong. The GAY at 20516. I don't know where you guys got that. That's like, I haven't oh. had that one in like five years. So it's, uh, okay. I'll give you my. Uh, sure, you can type that. Let's see if I can type. Can I type? Okay, well, George is typing. Um, George is just one of our. Uh, partners uh, in terms of delivering services. We can refer to him as a preferred partner for a contractor. So um, in case you need services, you can always reach out to him. Aside from George in the portal of Chicago Deal Vault, we actually have uh, various preferred partners that we can refer you to. For those who don't have access yet with Chicago Deal Vault, you can um, see this screen on my on your screen. You'll be able to see a lot of uh, tabs that's available and uh, resources that you can find, especially with off-market properties, MLS properties, um, as well as with a uh, list of cash buyers, private lenders, and all that. If you need training um, on a demo, perhaps, on how to use the portal, feel free to uh, schedule a demo. We'd be available uh, to help you. Uh, just click on this link that I will be sending. Um, aside from that, uh, we would also be able to 
um, give you today, since you were able to join the webinar, we are giving you a 30 day free trial access. For those who don't have access yet to Chicago Deal Vault, uh, we are giving 30 day free trial access. So here's um, the schedule for the training. If you want 30 day free trial access, uh, please feel free to log in or to um, to process your 30 day trial access through this link that I'll be uh, providing. And please don't forget to, uh, please don't forget to choose from the package here, select package, choose special Chicago deal vault. Uh, special Chicago deal vault will give you 30 day free trial access. So again, it's special Chicago deal vault. I'm gonna type that in. Um, if uh, for those who would need assistance with uh, getting the trial access, feel free to reach out to us. Um, Lovely is uh, on the line together with me to help you with getting the 30 day free trial access. So for those who doesn't have access yet. And uh, again, thank you so much, George. Thank you everyone for joining today. It has been a pleasure to, uh, to, to, assi to assist Hugo as today for the webinar and to help him with um, taking over the presentation to help uh, George as well. So yeah, um, feel free to inform us if, we, if you would like to uh, get 30 day free trial access. By the way, for the webinar today, we will be sending a recording, a replay that will be available tomorrow morning, most probably, and that um, we will also be giving you um, the uh, document that uh, that um, George has provided, has given to us. So just send us an email to support at chicagodealvault.com. So we'd be able and send us a request of the document that George has uh, provided so that we will be able to send the document to you as an example. Um, again, uh, I'm going to stay here for three more minutes uh, to know if someone will be willing to avail the 30 day free trial access of Chicago Deal Vault. Uh, this is again Chicago Deal Vault. And aside from George, we have other list of preferred partners that you can reach out to in case you need assistance. Um, George is one of them that we have available. And uh, aside from that, if you need training, we have also uh, we have also um, given a, a link for you to schedule a training here on the uh, system. And uh, yeah, I'm still available to assist you for three more minutes. If you have uh, uh, questions uh, about Chicago Deal Vault, uh, you can post it in the chat or you can send an email to support at Chicago Deal Vault. We'd be available to help you. Again, thank you so much everyone uh, for joining today. Have a good night uh, to the rest uh, who are still uh, on the line and uh, feel free again to reach out to us.